I hope you can see this now. Um, this is the cover picture of my, my dissertation. Uh, and I said it's, it's 20 years ago, <laughs> nearly. Uh, I finished this in 2001. Um, and, uh, but I still think that the topic, again, is more than up to date than, than ever, because also CLEP for sure, um, intensified by the corona situation, uh, the issue of how to combine technology and dance and artistic practices is um, for sure uh, very, um, very interesting for artists and also important also to, to be visible again. Uh, and for sure, uh, compared to the 90s, when I did my research, uh, technology is more accessible, is cheaper, much faster than at that time. Uh, but what I felt now like when looking back to what happened then and was this in discussion now, I felt like um, the discourses around the role of the body in relation to new media technologies um, at that time is not so far from what is now. It's still about the fear of losing the body, of the disappearance of the body in relation to being immersed, being kind of thrown into new technologies. And especially I felt, but maybe um, we can discuss this to, together later then also, um, this, uh, especially in the field of contemporary dance, this tension between the euphoria about new body expanding possibilities through technologies and a broader understanding. And on the other side, the fear of losing this central instrument, the human body in dance um, is still very present and also was uh, in the discourses around in the 90s. Um, and I think uh, looking back, this, this fear, especially around the, the body um, in dance, could also be rooted back to the tradition of the German Ausdruckstanz, um, the Ausdruckstanz, which was very influential not only in Germany, but also internationally, and where um, some a lot of the artists, uh, especially, for example, Isadora Duncan, you may know her, um, I show you a picture which is here uh, was um, uh, developing new concepts of dance which was based on the idea of the natural dancing body in connection to nature to the waves to breathing um, and its authenticity so kind of the creation of dance representing a natural body um, was very influential at that time and i think it still is in some of the discourses um, around um, but on the other hand, um, it was always also clear in dance that, um, especially also in the early uh, um, 20th century, that were also other people, kind of art artists really um, interested in experimenting with what is possible also at that time. Um, but uh, for sure, going back to this idea of dance as a natural body, um, this was always kind of in opposition to um, at that time the the tradition of ballet so when you look at this picture here in front of the cover you see that um, for sure uh, the body in dance is not such a simple natural body but it's a highly trained and maybe also technically dance technically formed body by um, by using the body by training it by also using specific training methods, especially like in ballet. So it's not about a natural body, it's always a formed body. Um, and these kind of techniques are inscribed into the body, I would say. So, but this tension was always there, this, this issue of um, the natural body versus the, the trained body, the kind of technologically adapted body. Um, and I would say also that uh, what Hans T. Lehmann wrote in the end of the 90s around um, theater and new technologies, which you can read here, um, is for sure um, also um, valid for dance at that time and still is. And maybe even in dance, there were more kind of experiments around how to, how to use new technologies um, in, in the field of dance. I don't read this uh, quotation to you because you can read it <laughs> yourself, I hope, and can, can see it. So it's about that theater was always kind of driven to implement all kinds of new technologies and media into its kind of machinery. And that for sure, uh, this didn't stop with the internet and that what you can see now, all the experiments, this is very true. Um, but yeah, um, giving a kind of a short overview also of this early um, use of um, dance technology or this kind of friendship from the very beginning on, as I said, uh, on the one end is kind of the idea of the natural body, the freely um, expressing 
body uh, around the Ausdruckstanz field. But on the other hand, there have always been um, connections to um, the idea of the mechanic body of the kind of um, uh, uh, body that is in, in kind of communication or dialogue with new technologies. And also, if you look back to the romantic ballet, the aesthetics of the romantic ballet, I would say in the 19th century, it's a completely different approach to technology, but also this, this image of the romantic ballet, the ballerina, I would say was created by at that time new technological inventions like oil and gas lighting or reflectors and filters and also flying machines that they could use at that time. And that together with the newly developed point shoot technique was the, the key to developing this idea of the antigraph image of the ballerina. So there was always kind of the idea how to include technology for creating a certain scenery or a certain body image. And then you can see a picture of Oscar Schlemmer's, maybe you know Oscar Schlemmer's uh, Bauhaus tradition like space sculptural costumes of the triadic ballet, which also refer in a way to body and mechanization. Um, and also in the uh, futuristic approaches, you find um, the idea of aerial art. So uh, a combination of understanding flying with airplanes as a kind of choreography, as a connection between body and machine. And for sure, already in the... Um, early photography and early film, there was a lot of um, interest into the moving body and in dances uh, practices. Um, what I would like to show you now and to start the film is uh, Loire Fuller. This is a film without sound, so I can just let it play. Um, she um, experimented in the also the beginning of the 20th century with a very a special costume you will see in a second, which is consisted of sticks and large lengths of fabric, fabric onto which she projected images and films, um, as well also try to experiment with lighting technology and colors and filters. So this is um, yeah around the beginning of the 20th century, and she was very adv advanced at that time and often seen as an example for this um, this close relationship. I think you, you have. Maybe you know it away anyway, so I, I stopped this now. Um, but um, just to give you a short um, yeah, idea of what was happening in the early times and the early um, connections in that field. What I would like to focus on um, one, one example of um, the choreographer Merce Cunningham. I guess the name is famili familiar to I guess a lot of you, maybe most of you, um, because he um, is very famous uh, for his, let's say, experimental work and also his kind of renewal of the idea of, of dance and choreography in general. Um, born in 1919, um, he died in 2009. And uh, I would say he, he is the one who throughout his whole career always was the one to really first experiment with what is possible in the field of media technology. Um, and uh, for sure, he's also very famous for his idea of understanding dance um, and as independent from music. And together with John Cage, he developed this idea of the parallel event of dance and music without a kind of connection. So dance being independent from music and not uh, simply kind of the um, accompaniment of, um, of each other. Um, so he was the one also very early starting to um, experiment with um, uh, uh, camera and television and video formats and really one of the first who understood the camera as a part of the choreography and to integrate also the medium, the television in this case, as you can see on the picture in his work and to really develop um, videos and dance films early, uh, it's not early anymore, but dance films um, that try to really understand and to use the medium as such and not simply kind of record um, dance performances. 
Um, and on the other hand, what was also, I think, remarkable and um, important to understand um, his approach to dance and choreography is um, the way he worked also kind of in connection to the music uh, field and his work together with John Cage to use uh, chants and aleatoric procedures um, in order to develop choreography. Um, as you can see here on this picture, this is um, a photo taken from uh, the solo, untitled solo from 53. And um, what you see here is a body jumping into the air with the head in the one direction and one leg kind of uh, stretch and the other one um, close to the belly and the arms going in two directions. And um, uh, what he did, especially with this piece, uh, he did it before, but here it was very obvious as a solo for himself, was to use um, aleatoric procedures, in that case, throwing the dice to determine the choreography. So you can imagine that he made kind of a chart, a list with body parts isolated, uh, and then by throwing the, the dice, determine in what kind of direction the body part is um, the body parts are, I have to say, because it was not about creating one figure, but creating individual um, movements for individual body parts. And then trying to put this chart as a choreography back on his body. Um, I show you um, a, a quotation from how he described this process. Um, so because here he described how complicated this was to develop a choreography on a paper. And then with bringing this back, as I tried to describe on the body, but saying, OK, the head is here, the arm is there. I have to do that. Um, I have to learn that by heart, but taking it from the paper and not develop it with the body before. And I always try to understand this kind of, let's say, choreographic technology as a form of um, film editing approach to cut it back on the body and to, to have um, individual kind of um, uh, uh, movements for individual parts and put back on the body in a parallel system. Um, and uh, this was very important because um, that's, uh, as I think, maybe one of the problems why people could not really, uh, or audiences did not really connect at that time to his, um, his choreography. Uh, because it was not about narration, it was not about um, fluid movement, um, nice movement, as people may have known from other, other fields or examples of dance. But um, also in the reviews, his, um, his choreographic approach uh, was often seen as cool, inhuman, too abstract, not easy to understand. Um, and uh, uh, this is important because later on, uh, in the end of the 80s, um, he started to work one as one of the first choreographers to work with a computer program, an animation program called Lifeforms. So it was developed by uh, software designers. And um, in um, 89, they approached him if he would like to use this. Because before he always said it would be interesting to develop a software that is able to notate movement and the other way around to also bring back notated movement back into, uh, into um, movement again. Um, and so he was very interested in that and started to work with it. And um, as you can see here, the basic idea of this software life forms at that time is it's simply an animation program. So there's a creator of um, of key figures, so of, of shapes, of body shapes, where you can design the position of limbs and body parts to each other. And so you create singular key figures, and then you put it, as you can see here, in a kind of notation system. Um, and you can determine the length of the, of the movements, um, the stops in between. So it's, it's simply an animation program. And the program then renders the, the movement in between. So for him, I guess it was something like developing what he did before um, with, the, with the paper and the charts. He also used, again, chance technologies to determine the body parts in action and to determine the key figures, and then developed uh, chore animated choreographies. Um, I tried to, in life forms at that time, I, I tried to make a short sketch to see this kind of, you can make any kind of choreographies where the key figures are not in a way 
uh, anatomically connected at all, but for sure the program then renders the transitions in between. And again, um, I think this, this idea of using film editing technique together with uh, aleatoric procedures is something that again here kind of came together. But for sure, um, again, in the reviews of the pieces he did uh, in the early 90s with computer software, it again was about now also dance is kind of loose, is in threat of losing its roots, it's losing its body, because um, it felt like also for, for journalists that and also for audiences that this natural um, kind of that art form is now also diving into um, technology and it's, it's losing its its kind of spirit. So again, his his choreographies were um, understood as inhuman, as mechanic, as rob roboter-like, um, because people try to see the um, the influence of the computer, the software program he worked he worked with, as something that is changing choreography. In fact, again, um, there were there were uh, quotations and and. Um, uh, um, documentaries on how he did that with the dancers. For the dancers, it was not, was not an easy process because, again, it was about the, the you could create keyframes key or the animations could do things the human body is not able to do, like rotating the head for 360 degree or rotating limbs like this. So, in a way, the, the creative process took place when the dancers were confronted with the animation and tried to bring that back on the body and find solutions for the animation to trans transfer it to the body again. Um, so and in the late uh, 90s, then also Cunningham, for sure, quite clear, started to work with motion capture, where for sure this is a completely other approach when um, the movement is kind of um, recorded um, by the use of sensors and suddenly again <laughs> people saw his pieces like this piece piped from uh, from 99 and again said now everything is fluent again so suddenly because this mechanic were taken out which in a way was traceable back to this idea of cutting now people um yeah reviewed it in a different way um I jump over um, the example of William Forsythe's work. If there is time later, I can send you the link for an example of this, because I think he was also very important in the 80s and 90s, not only for um, reframing ballet um, and, and its uh, choreographic approaches, but also because he was, again, one of the first trying to integrate um, the idea of algorithms in um, the way he choreographed or he gave kind of improvisation rules to his dancers. And in the 90s, there were also for sure examples about people who are on stage as a kind of narrative approach, try to discuss um, this danger again of new technologies and the body and the issue of losing oneself by addictive, immersive, in um, addictive, immersive worlds. And these immersive worlds were always represented on stage by VR glasses, for sure. So you could see dancers with VR glasses kind of losing themselves in another space. But what I would like to focus on um, in the second part is, again, Merce Cunningham and his um, also interactive um, work he did in um, the mid of the 60s. I don't know, maybe some of you know the piece Variations 5. It's a cooperation of Merce Cunningham and John Cage and also other um, musicians and also engineers. And I think that that's very interesting uh, as an approach because um, it was uh, one of the first pieces in the frame of theater and dance where um, uh, uh, interactive technologies in, uh, were, were integrated in the piece. So it was about giving the dancers control over the performance parameters like music, lighting, projections, etc. And I would follow here Suke Dinklers, uh, a media um, art researcher, and her definition also uh, around media art um, from the beginning or the end of the 70s, where she defined interactive artistic productions um, as, as those who are uh, in which a computer system reacts in real time to human input and thus creating a kind of cybernetic feedback between input and output 
and action and reaction. And that's what she defined in the end of the 90s, but actually this was already done in um, the 60s in this um, piece by Merce Cunningham and John Case. Um, so here I will, I will show you a short video very soon, but basically it can be said that the body of the dancer, though the bodies of the dancers are placed in a kind of electromagnetic field. Uh, and the body in this artistic work becomes a component of the si system in which every moment movement has an effect on the system as a whole. Um, and there in this, this early works, there's also a connection, I would say, to Marshall McLuhan's anthropo anthropomorphic interpretation of technology as, as a kind of a point of reference. So essential to McLuhan's theories is the idea that electricity understood by him as exter external nervous system, connects humanity in a world spanning electronic network with no geographical distances. And in this way, the body appears to be extended over the entire earth, which therefore implodes into a global village, which connects everyone um, everywhere. And the idea of this um, piece, Variations 5, I would suggest to say, uh, proves to be almost kind of a model study of this, this connection that was described in Marshall McLuhan's theory. So here you see um, one of the pictures of Variations 5. Um, and it's it's very interesting. I can send you um, or uh, put the, the link to the full piece uh, later on into the chat because it's uh, on YouTube and you can see the full piece. Um, it was recorded by um, the Norddeutsche Rundfunk in Hamburg in 66. And I would say it's also really an interesting historic example of how television was in that time. So I really recommend you to especially watch the first three minutes where it's about the introduction into this artistic work by the moderator of the of the um, of the television uh, broadcasting program. But anyway, so you see in the front, you see three music musicians, uh, John Cage um, and his colleagues, David Tudor and Gordon Mama. I hope it's correct how I, how I uh, pronounce it. And then you see these antennas on stage, and uh, in this case, two dancers, but actually there have been seven dancers in the piece. And these antennas are, work like motion detectors, and they react to the movement of the body, like electromagnetic fields, and by this um, trigger signals. Plus, they also used photoelectric cells attached to the foot stands of these antennas, can say like light barriers who act, were activated by shadow and light changes. And they also used contact microphones on the props, like on floor mats, artificial plants, a chair, a bicycle. And so the dancers in a way manipulated or triggered sounds by moving through the sta space and by also uh, touching the props, etc. And the three musicians in front, like engineers, kind of used the incoming signals for a real-time composition. And the dancers, if you want, are kind of sound suppliers in the system. So I would say this is also the reason why um, this, uh, this work is not so much uh, known also in the uh, biography of Merce Cunningham, because what I said before, it was always about dance being independent from music. And in this case, it's completely different because the dance is triggering the sound in a way is completely dependent on that. Um, so, but I show you a short um, excerpt of this um, to give you an impression. Thank <laughs> you. 
I stop it here um, so that it's long, but I think you you can also find that I will send you the links to this to, to the whole to the whole um, NDR production later on. So um, what I would try to say is that um, in a way this kind of idea of having an uh, interconnected system with a kind of mutual influence of every movement that is done in the system, which triggering sound, which is then kind of using incoming sickness also from radio waves. This was kind of really influenced by this idea of the global village and this interconnection. Um, and so there was also reviews on, on this piece, which you can read here, which praised this idea um, of a glimpse into the theater of the future um, where things are created sim simultaneously on stage. Um, so to come to an end, I think I have to keep an eye on the time. For sure, this example from mid 60s is something that um, is, I would say, already really advanced and is uh, then in the 90s, there were a lot of um, projects around interactive technologies um, as well used in, in dance. There's just to give you one example, um, at that time, the group Troika Ranch based in New York worked uh, a dancer, choreographer and a musician and software designer. They worked together also on this idea of um, creating a dialogue between the moving body and technology interactive settings. Uh, so they developed a so-called MIDI dancer at that time. That's what you can see in this picture. It's a kind of a bodysuit with sensors connected to the joints. And um, yeah, by contracting, for example, the arm or the leg, etc., cetera, um, they were triggering of sound, music, light, etc. And interestingly, the software um, is called Isadora. That was already developed in the 90s by Marco Cornelio, I guess, some of you, especially in the field of music, may know this program for sure, I guess. And what I think is, is interesting that it's called Isadora, because as I said before, Isadora Duncan is the one connected with the naturalness of the body. But in this case, it's about the extension of the body through technology in a way. Um, so um, I skip um, some quotes I pre prepared for you, which again should show the um, discussion in the field of the contemporary dance at that time between those who are really interested, really challenged kind of how to use new technologies, how to bring in the body in the field of VR and augmented technologies in order to say the, the knowledge of dances, the knowledge of dance is something that can be really helpful to understand how the body can can move, can can use in um, kind of augmented reality or VR augmented environments. Um, and this was always connected very much to um, uh, phenomenology and also to um, Merleau-Ponty with the idea of touching by seeing um, kind of also um, broadening and um, development, developing um, the, the body into the space. Um, and uh, Derek de Kerkhove, another kind of media phenomenologist from that time, was always argumenting that because of um, watching and um, hearing in a way is connecting with the world and this is only kind of prolonged by using technology so that in a way it's the body that is completely fully used in in these kind of settings but actually maybe you can also bring it out to say in a way the body is kind of a remote control as you do it when you watch television on your sofa and it's kind of controlling something via distance but maybe this is too too simple to bring it down um, but yeah, this is um, maybe kind of a wrap up that a lot of things already happened at that time um, and where um, dance was really kind of um, advanced in developing um, settings within their own technology. And uh, going, coming back to today, um, there was recently an article in the Zeit in Germany by uh, Jens Jessen about uh, coming back now out of the lockdown, going back into the world. He said that, um, again, the tension uh, was there between the real life and the virtual life, and that he was, again, praising the body and kind of warning um, of the dangers of the immersiveness of the computer. So I felt like this, this issue around losing the body, losing yourself, losing the senses in connection to technology, computer technology, VR, et cetera, is still kind of the same, there's still kind of 
tension is still there. But for sure, there are a lot of um, artists who now also work uh, with um, everything what is there what can be used so there will if you're interested you can watch a piece on the 17th of june by a hamburg based choreographer jasa yasha who just did a, a piece uh, around artificial intelligence and a neuronal web network that was writing a choreography for him which again a bit like Ernest cunningham did that with his animation in live forms um, in that case, it's the AI that was writing the choreography, and this choreography is brought back to the dancer's body. So you can watch that very soon online. Um, there's also another example of a group of artists from dance and fine arts, Mele Mishpikli, who developed, for example, um, uh, 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 an idea around um, using the body as diving into typology you this is something you can see as a magazine it's kind of a digital magazine contribution um they they worked on and the last one um is a project for sure this is also triggered by corona um a project where uh, a messenger in that case it's telegram uh, is used um with connected with a bot and is programmed for this project that kind of leads people through the city of Basel with the kind of interactive simulation of the bot talking to um, the audience member who is using his uh, smartphone to, to walk around the city and receive instructions, video, et cetera, uh, through the, the bot uh, and the messenger. So that to wrap up, there's a lot of things going on, still kind of, um, for sure a lot of curious and interest in how to to bring this thing together but i think it's it's still striking what already happened in the 60s and also the 90s and that not everything what seems always to be new is new but maybe it's it's simply more developed maybe that's not simple it's already a great step but yeah a lot of things are going on there so i stop the screen sharing now and stop talking and um yeah and over back again.